Today I'm talking to George Mallon, who uh, is one of the founder members of the Computer Arts Society. Uh, George has had a, a fascinating career in uh, starting as a scientist, moving on to uh, consultancy, uh, commercial consultancy on simulation, and also working with Gordon Pask in his own simulation company. And Gordon, uh, George has been on the fringe of computer arts for a very long time. George. Um, when I'm talking about the subject that interests us both, I mean, people use various terms, computer art, digital art, new media art, net art, and all that sort of thing. Do, do you have any strong feelings either for or against it? I don't have any strong feelings. I, I suppose um, computer art is the one I'm most familiar with, and I think we use it at the very beginning of, of, of this, uh, this uh, movement. Mm -hmm. So computer art is probably my favoured term. And would you... Do you like to briefly summarise your own contribution to, to digital art? I, I'm not quite sure whether to describe you as an artist or an academic or a, a, <laughs> an entrepreneur or a mover and shaker. You've been all of those, really, haven't you? Anyway? Yes, all, all confusion. I, I, I haven't produced that much computer art. I'm struggling to remember. I mean, the things I did do on the, on the project side were the Eco Game project mm -hmm. for Computer 70, which is a computer arts project. Um, but I haven't produced uh, what would be recognisable as artworks that you hang on the wall, or things like that. Mm -hmm. So most of my work was to do with putting together either exhibitions for the Computer Arts Society, or the major project being that I mentioned, you know, the, the um, Davos project. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But you were, you were pretty central in setting that up, weren't you? I mean, yes, I basically came up with the idea, yeah. and, um, and uh, at that time I'd been I just left working with Gordon Pask and been quite influenced by, certainly very influenced by him, but also by other aspects of the computer simulation world, particularly Jay Forrester mm. and something he developed called System Dynamics. And I used System Dynamics as the basis of the um, economic model at the heart of the EcoGame project. Right. Would you just like to briefly describe the eco game for, for people who don't know about it? Um, yes, it was a, I suppose we'd now call it a multi-user, multimedia uh, game, management game. Uh, it was innovative in the sense that these kind of things hadn't been done really before. I'm talking about 1970, where we developed a version for the Computer 70 exhibition at Olympia. And that worked inside a, a blue geodesic dome which had slide projecting screens, a uh, slide projector tower in the middle and screens around the outside and computer terminals at table level and people interacted through a, an economic model that I developed and uh, it, uh, depending on the results, it controlled the, the projection of, uh, of images which were chosen to as it were, <coughs> reflect the state of the economy that the players were making. So mm. If they were um, running the system hard and not producing wealth, then you got black and white images of the 1930s and things like that. But if it was going well, then you got nice colourful images of, of modern times. And uh, mm. that seemed to work very well. Mm. Yeah. And that obviously attracted a lot of attention at the beginning, and, and subsequently uh, Stafford Beer used it, didn't he, or some of the technology? Uh, no, so well, it's a, it was the other way around, actually. Um, Stafford had, yeah, I mean, Stafford had, was working with Allende in Chile, and he had seen what we're doing and used some of the slide projection mm. techniques and used the same company that um, I'd used, a company called Electrosonic, mm -hmm. and they had the computer-controlled slide projectors. and. Uh, we use these, and Stafford used these in Chile as well. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I've often wondered why why that sort of thing never never took off. Yeah. Uh, in what way? You well, mean, I, I'm not aware of any similar control room where somebody from the British government sits <laughs> and watches the economy <laughs> or something. Like that. No, well, yes, well, there's there's innovation and there's uh, yes. and there's conservatism and so on. Yeah. Yes. So it, it yes. was it was a bit of a stretch. Yes. the technology at the time. Yes, yes. Stafford took the ideas and, and I think it worked brilliantly to get them as far as, as, mm. as he did. Mm. Uh, the farthest we got was, uh, was Davos, mm. but uh, we did um, talk mm. quite seriously to the United Nations environment mm. uh, people after mm. the Davos implementation. Some of, some of their people had seen the implementation there. And the Stockholm Environment Conference was coming up 
73, was it? I can't remember. And there was talk of, of taking it there, but that never happened. Mm. Couldn't, get the, couldn't get the funding in the end, so it, it wasn't taken to the United Nations implementation. It was interesting in the early <coughs> days of computer arts, how, or computers, how people had all sorts of expectations, some of which were, have been brilliantly realised and others of which just have disappeared. Mm. I often think, uh, you know, the word cybernetics, for instance, was pretty crucial in the 60s. <laughs> and you never, ever hear it yeah, today. Yeah. Um, uh, except in a negative sense, you know, yes. uh, that um, I remember talking to someone at the cyber Science Museum about, about just that topic. Mm. and uh, They were very, I don't know, negative about cybernetics. Well, I was very enthusiastic, mm. I thought, you know, mm. in the 1960s. Mm. And people like uh, Stafford Beer and mm. Gordon Pask, Frank mm. George. Mm. Uh, uh, all beavering away and, and uh, you know, making some impact. Mm. But it got associated with the Cybermen, I suppose, and the technocrats and so on. So it, it uh, mm. Mm. didn't get beyond that. George, you, you mentioned uh, Gordon Pask earlier. I, I believe you, you actually worked with him uh, on his Colloquy of Mobiles piece at uh, the uh, Cybernetic Serendipity e Exhibition in 1968. Um, my connection with Gordon Pass came about through um, the development of my interest in simulation techniques, which I was working on at uh, the Royal Aircraft Establishment, uh, looking at uh, the analysis for the future development of Heathrow as a twin runway operation, and the various Q disciplines and holding patterns that would be required if it was to get to uh, if that was to come into existence. So that brought me into contact with digital simulation in a fairly intensive way uh, and I got really quite enthused about the potential of that mm. and um, wrote to my former mathematics tutor at Brighton, mm -hmm. Richard Goodman, mm -hmm. who uh, <coughs> best known for, his, for the volumes on cybernetics which he he edited in the early 70s, I think, late 60s and early 70s. And Richard put me in touch with, um, with Gordon, and um, uh, I went to see him, and he was developing a project with uh, the Home Office on the way that simulation might be used to help training of an analysis of uh, what was coming to be called crime intelligence systems. And I set up a, a simulation of a community with criminals who uh, did things and the, uh, the effort was recorded in, 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 on, on cards, the outcomes of things could be determined and, um, and that, that, that worked very well and formed the basis for my PhD in, <coughs> in later years. You then worked with Gordon on the colloquy of mobiles, didn't you? I didn't do much, I, mean, I didn't have much of that much to do with the electronic side of what, what Gordon was doing. That was largely down to a chap called Mark Dowson, um, who um, at that time was working at uh, NPL, mm -hmm. or went to work at NPL. He, he had uh, uh, done his degree at Sussex University, and uh, Mark developed the colloquy of mobiles and the technology for that, and so it implemented my role. I was a very humble one of transporting stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to hang it properly so that it could at least pretend to work. But how, how did you feel? I mean, as a, as a, a scientist, if I may say so, rather than an artist at the time, um, how, how did you feel when you saw cybernetic serendipity? You know, this was this was groundbreaking stuff. Uh, did it seem weird? Did it seem interesting? It was certainly very interesting, and I found extremely stimulating mm. you know, to be working with people mm. outside the scientific world. I'd, I'd grown up, if you like, in 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 technology, um, so starting off as a, an apprentice at Farnborough and then uh, eventually doing a degree in physics. Um, and uh, then the uh, almost accidental encounter with PASC and the, through, as I said, the mathematics guy at Brighton, uh, uh, Richard Goodman. And um, I just found the area completely fascinating. So when I, I, I came up to, for an interview with Gordon and uh, he offered me a job and I took it and uh, uprooted the family because <laughs> we had a small, small child at the time and moved into a flat in Richmond yes. and uh, uh, that was that. Do you have any particular memories of cybernetic serendipity of any of the other exhibits? 
Uh, I remember the um, the uh, head thing that you know. Uh, what was it called? Uh, it, it looked at you when you spoke. It had uh, acoustic. Oh, no, I think it's uh, it called Sam. I think. Yeah, uh, Ignatovich is Sam. Yes. Stood for and he also had the it. the hand lever thing. That was right. another Ignatovich yeah. thing. So yeah. these are two things that perhaps I remember most yes. Yes. of cybernetic serendipity. Yeah. Yes. That was fascinating. Yes, yeah. it seems to be very popular too. Yes, a lot yeah. of people came to see it. Yeah. Yes. And uh, the remains of <coughs> Edward's project, the Sensor, you know, was was mm. there, but uh, mm. probably the last time it did anything. Mm. So then you and a couple of others founded the Computer Art Society. Yes, that was in. That came about after we'd been to the IFIP Congress in Edinburgh, '62, was it? Would it be 62? I can't remember. A decade slip away. Perhaps it was later than that. 68. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, why was I at the IFIP Congress? Probably I persuaded Gordon that uh, I was working at System Research at the time, that it was a good thing to do. And, and I went there and met up with um, uh, John Lansdowne and uh, Alan Sutcliffe. And the three of us then formed, when we came back from Edinburgh, formed the uh, Computer Arts Society. And it, Took root in um, in Russell Square, where John had a uh, an architectural practice, and um, he lived in a flat above above the practice, so it was very convenient. Um, we were able to use the architectural offices for meetings of the society, and it was very convenient for tube trains and travel. So people came, and um, and uh, the society took off from that. George, what uh, was the impact of the Computer Arts Society in, in, in the digital art world? What did it actually do? Mm. Well, the Computer Arts Society really emerged from uh, the um, meeting of the IFIP, International Federation of Information Processing, at, in Edinburgh in 1960. When was it? You know, I can't remember. 1962? That seems a long time ago. But well, anyway. It was, uh, wasn't it, it was after so. it was Was it before or after Cybernetics? <coughs> I think it was after. Yeah. Mm. And um, um, but it, through, it did a lot of things to encourage computer art, digital art. In the oh yes, very much so. I mean, we um, employed Gustav Metzger for one thing. Or yeah, Gustav got involved in the early days. Mm. But some of the earliest stuff we did was really uh, around the idea mm. of making computing resources yes. available to artists, because mm. at that time, late mm. 50s, early 60s, and so on, mm. computers were locked up in high scientific worlds like Farnborough or, or the academic world, King's College and so on. And getting access uh, for artists was uh, quite difficult. So the Computer Arts Society really came into existence to try to do that. And um, we did it initially by persuading the um, early timesharing companies, like uh, there was a company called Timesharing Limited, run by a chap called Dick Evans, mm. and it provided um, uh, modem connection, internet, you know, uh, teletype and modem connections to his computer. I had one in my office across in, in, in Twickenham. And um, that, I think, began the development of, uh, of artists using computing, because we, we managed to persuade him to uh, make his office and facility where was it? It was up near Tottenham Court Road somewhere. And um, we took that over for a Saturday uh, and publicised that we were going to have you know, computing terminals available and people who wanted to find out about, com artists who wanted to find out about computing could come along. And they did. And uh, we showed them a bit about what programmes were, you know, very <laughs> primitive software <laughs> ideas. And um, it, it started really from there. The Computer Arts Society then evolved from from that beginning. It's amazing how the world has changed, isn't it? I can just imagine the reaction if you went to a business today and said, can we let a group of artists take over your computer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I suppose one of the, the CAS's roles has always been as a kind of intermediary and information source. I mean, the, the, the yes. way that the, the um, eco game started was really because somebody came to you and asked for your advice on, on, on this and, um, and the CAS was a kind of a, a front end for a lot of struggling artists I mean, struggling in the sense of trying to work out how to use computers. Well uh, yeah I think everyone was at the time because um, the, the, the simple aim you know to, to allow artists to 
learn how to program and mm. I think most of the um, early stuff was really round about random number generators and, and the fun things you could do with those and um, applying that to graphics particularly uh, was a common a common uh, challenge for for people interested in the arts and um, well, and I still have, I can't, don't think you can see it from here, but I have a piece of sculpture out there which was from that time, which uh, w was uh, made up of uh, squares of, um, c uh, of steel, about that square. And uh, the sculpture began as a simulation by picking an edge and then picking an orientation and then welding a plate there right. and then doing it with another edge and, and the thing just grew like that. So, it was very extremely dangerous and, and surprised my children. It was there while my children were growing up and they didn't manage to execute themselves on it. But <laughs> <laughs> and the CAS did, in fact, make quite a collection of digital art, didn't they? Yes, it did. Did you, yeah. you go into well, the V&A, didn't you? Yes, well, over the years um, and exhibitions. We ran exhibitions in oh, various places. I suppose one of the key ones was in 73 in, in, at the Edinburgh Festival mm. where we had a a space um, uh, for computer art and that proved very popular. People came along to have a look at it. It, it fascinates me this idea of, of collecting digital art because a, a lot of it is, is uncollectible. Yes, it's sense. just programmed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I found very, very few people who actually admit to owning a work of digital art <laughs> other, other than what <laughs> they made themselves. Yeah. So you're a first, actually, so far. Well, all, ours, all, of my, all the stuff that we collected was really just uh, um, looking after stuff for Computer Art Society mm. exhibitions. So mm. people bring stuff along and it would get left behind. And mm. Mm. we just gradually built up bits and pieces from that. Not a big collection. I, I can't remember how many works there were. 70 or 80 or something mm. of that kind, mm. uh, which we then... But as it, as it, I mean, a lot of it sort of shades off more into conceptual art in a way, doesn't it? Yes, you it did. Yeah. Pen drawings and things like that yeah. made by a plotter or sculptures. Yeah. But uh, yeah. when, when you get onto something, I don't know. Example that comes to mind is uh, Media Group of Big uh, package from Mr. Assange, where they sent a parcel to Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy with a with a, a webcam inside it, and it was broadcasting photographs to, uh, which were appearing live on Twitter. <laughs> I don't remember when it, I don't know, it was Twitter time. That was quite that. that was quite recent. <laughs> yes. Wasn't it? yes, it yeah. was. Yes, yeah. it was last year, I think. Um, but uh, I mean, in in the digital world, uh, the digital art world. I mean, who who do you think are the influencers, the gatekeepers, the people who decide what is what is important? And well, I saw that question. I, I, I thought about it. And I really don't know. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, in the early days, writers like Jonathan Bentall mm. uh, was quite a, a, a supporter mm. of computer art, and his writings, I think, uh, were, were quite in, in influential. Mm. Mm. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, well, fair enough. I mean, mm. it's, 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 uh, it's an elusive subject sometimes. But have you ever, you know, who do you think are the audiences for digital art? Who, who then and who now actually looks at this sort of stuff or is interested in this sort of stuff, apart from us? <laughs> well, then, um, I suppose it was simply, you know, the, the people who were, uh, had, had uh, freedom to explore, a, you know, the, the application of computing outside mm. the business of scientific mm. communities, and these were very few and far between. I don't mm. think uh, many art colleges had mm. computers until mm. after the Royal College of Art and my work there. Mm. Um, and uh, I suppose it, 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 uh, it, it grew uh, just by word of mouth, and, um, people using learning programming. Mm. Computer Art Society, as I said, ran mm. programming tuition courses mm. in London and people came to those and gradually mm. things spread. People like uh, Tony Pritchett and Colin Emmett. Mm -hmm. Tony did his famous uh, Flexipede animation. Mm. Um, uh, the Royal College of Art with uh, Colin Emmett and so on did the um, Finite Elements film which was the first time, I think, that computer animation had been used for a purely educational purpose. The film was about the finite element mathematics engineering okay. um, 
engineering uh, tool mm -hmm. and that uh, lend itself to visualization rather well. So you could look at stresses as, uh, on, on a bridge, for example, using, using color graphics. And I think that, uh, that had quite an influence. Mm -hmm. Can we turn to the, the elephant in the room, the, the, the question of money? How, how are digital arts practices funded generally in your experience? At least I hope that's what it was. No, it's flashing now. Let's start that one again. I do apologise. Um, what was the question? <laughs> well, let, let's start from the beginning. I'm sorry about that. Um, the, the elephant in the room with any discussion of art tends to be money. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you have any idea who, who funds digital art. I mean, presumably at the beginning, it was largely funded by the artists themselves. Yes, I think so. You know, people with an interest in it just doing it. But um, uh, in the very early days uh, of the Computer Arts Society, and we did the, um, the um, project at Computer 70, mm -hmm. which was really a kind of beginning of, uh, a kind of the public, mm -hmm. of bringing this stuff to the public at large. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a uh, Computer Arts Society was commissioned to do that, so it got a budget. And we hired a geodesic dome, blue dome, which um, probably in the height of this room. And, uh, and we put slide projectors and um, computer terminals mm. in that to create a, a norm office ambience for uh, exploring or opening people's minds, if you like, to the idea that computer graphics at least could go beyond the office and scientific uh, application and uh, become a medium in, in its own right. But you built up quite a successful computer consultancy, didn't you, or consultancy company on the basis largely of simulation? Uh, yes, I mean I called it system simulation because that was what I was interested in. Um, it did a whole range of variety of works and it, uh, it still thrives and, uh, and works on a whole range of, of uh, software projects now. Uh, it's based in, um, in uh, I was going to say Covent Garden, but it moved recently from Covent Garden. To it, it does strike me that you know, in the early days, digital arts are sort of on the borders of everything. I mean, partly it was, you, know, you, you might say that uh, the echo game was a form of digital art. Yes, it was. <coughs> it was might not, but, yeah. it might, but you wouldn't probably say that designing simulations for Heathrow was. No, yeah, uh, exactly. No, but certainly I saw um, I saw the eco game as a definitely a computer art society project. It brought together a range of creative people, uh, from Anthony Dalton who provided the slides, uh, John McNulty who provided the um, connections into um, into the uh, electrosonic people who provided the computer control slide projectors and all that sort of stuff. So it was very much a coming together of um, people who were who, who able to share a vision of what might be possible and to make it happen. And then you were instrumental in getting computer arts faculties or departments in, in uh, academia, weren't you? Yes, uh, we, I suppose the beginning was the, the, um, in the Department of Design Research at uh, the Royal College of Art, where I was a research fellow. And um, uh, as a result of all this, I set up something called the Computing Activities Unit, which mm -hmm. <laughs> raised a few eyebrows in the senior <laughs> common room of the Royal College of Art, but uh, it took root, uh, and um, before long it was uh, it was teaching and, and uh, introducing visual arts students to computing, and the rest is history, as you say. Did you find that the the, the traditional visual artists were hostile? Yes, suspicious. Yeah, I think they were. Yes, I mean they were open-minded, but some 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 were hostile. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not the sort of thing that you should, should be doing. You know. Was that because they thought you were a waste of time or because they thought one day you might take over from you? I don't know. I mean, I think it was just a fear of uh, a technophobia, really, uh, at that time, if you remember. Um, uh, computing, as I've said before, was very much in the province of high science and big business mm. and not really in the art world at all. So artists would have uh, uh, reflected that zeitgeist of... Mm. Of, of technophobia, if you like. Mm. And, uh, I saw it as one of the challenges for mm. us to try to, to break that down by, by doing stuff in the Royal College mm. of Art and elsewhere. Mm. Mm. I mean, there was a, a, I can't remember the exact reference, but one of the early German pioneers of, of, of plotter art uh, said somewhere that, in fact, 
computers would demystify art and would, you know one day uh, art would cease to seem to be a human activity computers would do it as well or better uh -huh. uh, do you think there was any feeling of that at the time i think there was uh, kind of, as i said i used the term technophobia yes. there were artists who were a bit yes. scared of what might yeah. happen and, and and lose control yes in in, in the human sense yeah. Okay, you, you could see that happening, but uh, it, the, that is, in my view, was largely, hugely outweighed by the potential for you know, much more creative um, applications of what was essentially a new medium, a new, a new aid to thought processes. Mm, exactly. And, and the CAS now doesn't... Uh, well, it's changed a lot, hasn't it, in the, in the last 50 years? I mean, it, well, years 50 ago. years, good Lord, yes. Uh, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's, it's still the Computer Arts Society, and it mm. meets and runs an annual conference, mm -hmm. the EVA, Electronic mm -hmm. and the Visual Arts, mm -hmm. which oh, I suppose started many, many years ago. Uh, and it still, still runs that, so it's still very much alive. And it's fairly close to the Lumen Prize, isn't it, as I understand it? You, you yes, I think uh, uh, Nick... Um, Nick Lambert and the connection to Birkbeck and so on was quite influential in, in, in making that happen. Yeah. So in a way, it, it's still acting as a kind of behind-the-scenes facilitator, well, not only yeah. behind-the-scenes, a facilitator and a... Yeah, I think it's very much that's its role, yes. you know, and uh, uh, has been and continues, continues to do that. Mm. The digital arts are obviously much more widely accepted now than they were 50 years ago. Um, what effect does this have in practice, in, in, in your experience? Well, I, I think there's a sense in which the computing medium has kind of merged into, into the human activity generally. It's now accepted as really part of everyday existence, you know, whether it's animations that we see advertising soap or things on television. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it's now, it's now mm -hmm. part and parcel of our media Mm. processes and mm. the human animal has always been very good at developing mm. media processes mm. and uh, this is uh, another step you know mm. from from the uh, cave paintings yes. right through to to now and the uh, idea that you might use computing techniques as a, an adjunct to human imagination to envisage things and work out things that might not be possible otherwise are there any trends in digital art which you think are particularly important for the future or trends which you'd like to see die away? I'm thinking particularly of a piece by Brian Reffing Smith in White Heat Film Logic in which he says that there's a whole treasure trove of, of ideas from the early days which were started but then abandoned which he thinks should be revived. And he, again. Yes, well I wonder what was in Brian's mind when he said that because it probably certainly is the case that mm. there were a lot of ideas mm. being mooted mm. and kicked around uh, but one it wasn't possible to implement them because the technology mm. wasn't up to it and um, uh, it's different today and people like um, Paul Brown and his son Danny Brown do really quite amazing things with uh, yeah. the basic computer graphics yes. and produce images yes. uh, of a quite startling nature. Yes. Mm. yes, but you don't have any idea, you know, have you ever come across something which you thought was a, a, a really good idea but which hasn't been followed up? Uh, I would have to have a <laughs> good think about yes, that. I'm sure. I'm sure there are. Need notice uh, of that question. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, at the same time, I mean, um, society and the art world have been changing. Computers are regarded in a very different way now. And it, 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 mm. I find myself thinking it's uh, talking about digital art is almost an anachronism because you know increasingly most most art has some trace of <coughs> trace of the digital somewhere. Yes, uh, yes, well, uh, and even David Hockney with his, yes, with his iPad. pad. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, are, are there any changes that you would still like to see in, in the way that the computer is accepted, the way that we live with these things? Uh, I, th I think the process has started, it's mm -hmm. unstoppable, people mm -hmm. will develop it, and uh, as I said uh, many times before, the challenge that I saw was the way in which um, the computer not just a you know a drawing tool or a plotting tool, but was in fact an extension of the imagination in the sense that when we imagine things, we make models of the world and 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 uh, project that. And for me, the uh, core was the use of the computer as a modelling medium, rather like the brain, and and that the two things would eventually uh, complement 
each other, and uh, that's that's happening, I think. It seems to me the tragedy of, of, of one of the tragedies of, of, of digital art history is that or computer history is that it started off with, with your kind of enthusiasm and optimism and seeing it as a fantastic tool, and nowadays people tend to talk more about the negative side, you know, surveillance and uh, data, yes. control, and mm. that sort of thing. Um, and that's uh, very sad, I think. <laughs> I think we're missing out a lot of opportunities. Well, I think that that was always there. I mentioned earlier the kind of reaction that we had in the Royal College of Art in the 19... When was that, the Royal College of Art? 60s, 70s? Um, and there was a very you know, antipathy <laughs> to the idea that we might use technology, particularly computing technology, uh, as, a, as a tool in the college. There was some opposition to that. Eventually it went away, but... Uh, because it, I mean, the development of the medium was unstoppable. And uh, the, the, the forces at work in the college, like the readability of print unit, for example, began to use computing as well as the, uh, uh, the design research department and myself and Brian. Uh, and yeah, so it gradually spread, yeah. spread its message. Are you, you're still very actively involved with the uh, Computer Arts Society. Well, not so much, but yeah. Where, where do you... Uh, where do you think it should go over the next 50 years? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in a sense, w one could say it's, it's, done its, it's done its work. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take its work as being introducing mm -hmm. uh, computing into the art world and having it adopted and used mm -hmm. widely and so on, that's happened. Mm -hmm. So I think in the future we'll just see m more impressive uh, use of the, of the technology and particularly the merging, as I said, of the human imagination with the computers modeling capability and astonishing uh, well simulation techniques that are now widely used in, in, in all areas of science and seeing these being put to imaginative use I think will continue. Mm. Okay. George Mellon, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>